Why is it worth your time and energy and sacrifice to go through 52 lessons to learn about the Bible? Because it's going to be a big sacrifice. It's going to take mental energy. It's going to take your time. And uh, it's going to take some commitment. So why should we do that? Well, the reason is... If you want to find the meaning and purpose in your life, you first have to understand, you have to know God who created you. And so there are three ways that you can know God, or three levels we can think about it. Now, if you went through our journey of a, through the names of God a while back, you've heard this, but it's a good time to review it. Three ways that you know God. The first way that you can know God is called general revelation. This is not in your book. This is just a preamble. You can take notes. This is for free. I have some free stuff, and that'll always be over here on the whiteboard. So general revelation. Now general revelation is what you can know about God using your five senses looking at nature, looking at creation. And the Bible says there's basically two things that you can know about God by looking at creation. You can know that He is intelligent and He is powerful. For example, did you know if we put all the smart people together in the world and we used all of our technology, that we can't make one living cell from scratch. Now they can take pieces and parts and kind of put them together and manipulate them, but they can't start with raw material and build one cell, one living cell. Isn't that amazing? And all the things we can't do, can't create one living cell. Now here's the irony. Your body is a collection of trillions and trillions of living cells that are in a very unbelievably complex way working together. And if they stop doing that, you die. And yet, we are, the Bible said, fearfully and wonderfully made. And so, we can know two things, right, about God who has made us. He's intelligent, far beyond what we can comprehend, and He also is powerful. Looking at of course, our body is an example, but also you look up into the heavens, the galaxies, the far universes. If God created this universe, He created life, His intelligence and His power are far, behind, far beyond what we can comprehend. So that's the most basic way that you can know God, through general revelation. It's called general because it's just available to anyone. Now the next thing we have here is called special revelation. What special revelation means is that at times in history past, God has acted and He has spoken to mankind. And so when God has done this special supernatural connection with mankind, we're able to learn two other things about God. We can learn a lot, but generally two things. We can learn God's character and we can learn His purpose. So for example, if Moses had gone out into the wilderness and meditated for his whole life, he would never have figured out from general revelation the Ten Commandments. The only way he could understand God's law, God's purposes about life, how the world works, is if God in a special, supernatural, unusual way came and spoke to him and told him the Ten Commandments. And that's why the Bible that we're studying is so important. The Bible, when we look at its contents, is special revelation. That's why it's so important for us. As a matter of fact, it's called the Holy Bible. Bible just means book. Holy just means special. Why is this a special book? Because this is God's recorded special revelation for mankind is found in this book. And it is only through special revelation that we can understand God's character, what kind of God He is, and we can understand what His purposes are. Now that's very important because if God created you and put you on this planet, you can never understand the purpose for your life unless you understand God's big purposes in the world. So the two, first two levels, basically you can learn through general revelation that God is intelligent and powerful. Through His special revelation, you can learn about God's character, what kind of God He is. You can also learn His purpose for making the universe. And then we have a third level here that we learn about in the New Testament. It's a level called a personal relationship. Now, a personal relationship, in a very simple way, just means this. There, the Bible says you can have a personal relationship with God like this. Of course, personal means you have to do it yourself. Your grandmother, your granddad, your uncle, your aunt can't do it for you. It's personal. Each person has to individually do this to have a relationship. And it's this. You have to hear God's Word, hear the truth of God, His special revelation, hear God's truth, you have to experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit 
I'll just put the Holy Spirit. And finally, you have to respond in faithful obedience. That's what it means to have a personal relationship with God. That's something that no one can do for you, is to hear God's special revelation in the light of God's general revelation, then experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the, the testimony of the Holy Spirit that says this is true and opens your eyes to the truth of God's Word. But then there's a third part. You have to respond in faithful obedience. And the Bible says if we do that, we have follow this process of hearing God's Word, responding in faithful obedience. That's what it means to have a personal relationship with the Lord. So why should you take out 52 weeks, right, 52 class, uh, lessons to go through this big, thick book to learn about God's way, Word? There's only one place in the world that you can learn about God's character and His purpose, which means there's only one place that you can learn about God's intended purpose for your life, and that's in His special revelation, which is in His Bible. And so that's why I would encourage you, this should just be the beginning of your journey if you haven't studied the Bible a lot, because it's, you're not ever, I think that God has made the Bible so big and so complex as we're going to see, that no one person can really understand it all. There's some people I think that they think they understand it all, but I'm sure that they don't. It's that complicated and that big. So that's why we're going to take the time out to do it. All right, now we're ready to start. Just flip on over to page one. And you'll see a few more things there in the introduction. If you have more questions about this personal relationship, you can see the last page of the introduction, which talks about the spiritual preparation for your journey. Okay, so this first lesson is really like putting shelves up in your cabinet in your cabinets or your pantry, we should say. Now, what would it be like if you went shopping at the grocery store, you came to your pantry, and you had no shelves, and you just kind of started throwing stuff in there? <coughs> Everything would probably go in there. You'd have lots of space, but would you be able to find much later? Right? It would take a lot of effort to find stuff. So that's what we're going to do in this first laying a foundation lesson. We're really just going to try to build some shelves, like putting shelves in your cabinet. So when we learn things later, we'll have shelves that we can put things. We can put things in places where we can understand them, and we can get at them later. All right. The Bible, I'm just going to begin reading from that first paragraph on page one to get us started. It says, The Bible has been a source of comfort and inspiration to mankind for more than 2,500 years. No follower of Jesus Christ can be happy and effective without a basic knowledge of the Bible. What does it say in, in Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.15 about why a Christian should study the Bible? And you'll see a suggested answer up here and then I'll read the passage from my lesson here. It says, do your best to present yourself to God approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who handles the word of God, the word of truth. So why should a Christian take the time to learn God's word? Because we're commanded to be good stewards, to be able to handle God's way in an appropriate way so that we can apply it to our own lives and understanding God's character and His purpose and also that we can share it with other people, which we're going to learn about later. So during these 52 lessons, we're going to try to discover the message in each book of the Bible. Now that doesn't mean we're going to do a whole week's lesson on one book of the Bible. Some weeks we'll uh, spend, cover three or four of the smaller books, but we're going to take a look into each of the, each of the uh, books in the Bible and learn why they are where they are and where they fit in history and also to learn their basic message. So the Bible is the most amazing book in the world. There's no question about that. As a matter of fact, there is no piece of literature that mankind has that's even close to its influence in the world, and it's the number of ancient copies that testifies to the, valid the validity of it. Um, it was written over a period of about 1,500 years. They believe the common estimate is the exodus out of uh, Egypt was about 1445 B.C., and of course Jesus was born when? Around zero, right? That's the hinge of history in our date and time. So that's about 1,500 years, and it goes on a little beyond, so roughly 1,500 years. It's written. We don't know exactly how many authors, but it's estimated about 40 different authors. And I think it's really fascinating when you look at the life and the trades of the people who wrote. You can see a list here in the middle of the paragraph, in the middle of the page. Some were shepherds, some were farmers, some were tent makers, some physicians, fishermen, philosophers, 
kings, tax collectors. There were all these different people from different backgrounds over this 1500 span, uh, 1500 year span of time on three different continents. But yet the author, the story, it's one coherent story as we're going to see. So who is the one author? You'll see that next blank there on the bottom of page one, according to 2 Peter 121. It says, There is no prophecy ever made by the act of a human, of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So the Bible as it says here, it's been translated into 1,100 languages. Now, I'm going to give you an update. Actually, it's closer to 4,000 languages that the Bible has been translated into. There's an estimated about 6,000 languages in the world, um, and about half of those, over half of those now, have at least part of the Bible translated into those languages. Um, and now we'll look at the bottom of page 1, the theme of the Bible, which is very important. We're going to start in Genesis, learn about Genesis next week. We're going to spend all of next week talking about the book of Genesis, and then we're going to go all the way to Revelation. But the theme is really one theme, and the theme is about the redemption of mankind. Now over to page two. Here is the basic story of the Bible. God made this world in a certain way. He calls it very good in the way that He had made it. And then we see that, man's, that angels first sinned, rebelled against God, then mankind sinned, rebelled against God, and that corrupted the creation as God had made it. That happens, by the way, by Genesis 3, that happens. And so by Genesis 4, the rest of the story from Genesis 4 on to the end of the Bible, Revelation is God's story, how He is working through history to redeem mankind, to restore that very good order. And the theme of the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New Testament. There's two parts that we're going to learn about. The Old Testament lays the foundation to say there's a coming Messiah, that there's one who's going to come, lots of prophecies we're going to look at. And then in the New Testament, we see the hope for Messiah, who said was going to be a son of David, son of Abraham, and of course the son of Eve, which you can see back in uh, Genesis 3.15. And there's a genealogy in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1 in Matthew, that goes all the way back to Genesis. And what it shows is that the name of the Messiah that is coming is, you can probably guess it, Jesus Christ. And Christ is just the Greek version of the word Messiah, the promised one. Okay, now... We do a little bit of kind of homework. Talk about building shelves. That's what we're going to do now. We're going to talk about the divisions of the Bible. There are two basic divisions in the Bible. And if you have a Bible with you, if you don't, uh, don't worry about it. But if you have one, bring one with you next week. If you have your Bible, I just want you to turn to the middle. And when I say the middle, I don't mean the middle of the number of pages. I mean the middle between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, what is the first book in the New Testament? Matthew, that's right. And what's the last book in the Old Testament? Another M word, Malachi. And you're going to notice my book, Bible, by the way, is a study Bible. It has a lot of extra pages in the back. But one thing that you're going to notice is that the Old Testament makes up about three-fourths of the Bible. And the New Testament makes up about a fourth. And the Old Testament ha is built like a library. So one of the reasons it's important to do a class like this and to learn your Bible is because it's very discouraging. If you picked up this Bible and you thought, man, I'm just going to start reading this thing. You would just start reading, and then all of a sudden you would get confused because this is not organized like a single book. It's organized like a library. And there are really two libraries. There's an Old Testament library, and there's a New Testament library. So here's the Old Testament library. I have it right here on this little picture. The best example of how I've had it explained to me, I drew up this little chart, is to imagine it like this. There are five, four bookshelves in the Old Testament and four bookshelves in the New Testament. And on each shelf, there's different kinds of books. And so the first shelf in the Old Testament are called the books of law or the books of Moses. And there are five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And it is commonly believed and assumed that Moses was the compiler or the author of these five books. So they're often called the books of Moses. But we know he didn't like write the last book of De Deuteronomy. Does anyone know why? Somebody dies in the last chapter of Deuteronomy. Who is it? 
Moses dies. So we know he didn't write the last chapter because he died in the last chapter. But it's just generally assumed, scholars say, we attest those first five books. They were compiled or they were written down in the time of Moses. So they're called the books of Moses or they're called the law because it also contains the Ten Commandments and all the ritual laws. Then we have a second part of the Old Testament, which are the books of history. Here are the books of history. We've got Moses there. The books of history begins with Joshua, goes into Judges, Ruth, and the, the uh, story of Ruth is a historical book, but her, her life takes place in the time of the Judges. So after Ruth, we have 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. And this covers the span of time from the time that the uh, and the nation of Israel, after Moses leads them out of the promised land, and then they come into the promised land, and then they occupy it, and they divide it up, and all that happens during the time of, the judge, of Joshua and the judges. And then, of course, you know, then they start with kings, and all that goes through, and then the nation goes up and down, has a lot of really bad kings that we're going to learn about, and eventually the, the nation is so disobedient to God, it breaks down. Remember we talked about when they reject God's ways, man starts thinking they know better. It degrades the system. The country falls apart because of corruption and other reasons, and then God allows the entire country to be destroyed. Even the temple was destroyed and carried off the people into exile. And so this covers from 1 Samuel to 2 uh, Chronicles, con uh, covers all of these stories all the way through the exile. And then we have the books of, Nehem of Nehemiah and Esther, which are both written in the time of the Exodus. Esther, as you know, she was living in Exodus, and Nehemiah was living in ex Exodus, and so was Ezra. So those three books are from the time of Exodus. The Exodus. And then after that shelf, we have 12 books of history that are contained in the Old Testament library. And then we have five books of wisdom or poetry, some people call them. And they're a collection of books that we're going to look at that have different things. But they're, they're, they're more of like literary pieces. They're not historical. They're not chronologically. Psalms is like psalms or like songs that we would sing, hymns that were sung by choirs. Uh, the book of Job is really a wisdom. It's considered the oldest book. The first book recorded in the Bible is the book of Job, which considers the, most old, the oldest question to humankind, which is, how can a loving God allow people he loves to suffer? Isn't it interesting that that's what the oldest book in the Bible considers that question? And it's 40 chapters long talking about that issue. Um, and of course, that's Job talking about that. And then Proverbs, of course, are these Proverbs that are collected, wise sayings and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. We'll look at each of those. And then we come into the fourth section, the final section, the middle section, which usually gets people lost. And that's the section of the prophets. Now, what is a prophet? A prophet is, is simply a spokesperson for another person. So a prophet, in this case, is a person who speaks on behalf of God. Is that God would choose certain people, He would give them a special revelation, and then their job was to go and speak or preach what God had told them to the people. And they had a test for prophets. If the prophet <laughs> said something and it came true, then they were a true prophet. If the prophet said something that didn't come true, they were commanded to kill them. That's how important and how careful they were about the prophets they listened to. And so we have subdivisions, of course, in these prophets. That's why I have on this shelf, there's five blue ones that are bigger books. We have two different kinds of prophets. We have the major prophets. Major doesn't mean that they're important. Major just means big. So the major prophets are just books that are bigger. There are more pages in the major prophets. And then we have the minor prophets which are smaller. It doesn't mean they're less important, it just means their book or, books are, are smaller. And of course the uh, one sort of exception here is the book of Lamentation is written by Jeremiah. Other than that, they are written, the name of the book is the person who is the author. So these are the major prophets which come right after the books of, of, uh, of wisdom. And then we have the minor prophets which are all those small books. We have six, 17 of those which are contained on that final shelf. So this is our Old Testament library. We have five books of Moses, 12 books of history, five books of wisdom, and 17 books of prophets. Now the thing that you have to understand that gets people confused is these prophets wrote and lived in the time of history. So what we're actually going to do when we look at these prophets, we're going to go back and kind of pull the book off the shelf of where and when these people lived. And that's why it becomes very confusing if you just try to read through the Bible to put the pieces together, because they're not necessarily put together in chronological order. And so it's very helpful in your, in your Bible to have some notes, which we'll look at, to help us understand this prophet was spoken this time, this prophet, prophet spoken that time, and that's how it works. And that's how it makes it easier to understand how, the, how it all functions. And then when you do that, it all makes perfect sense. 
Okay, on to page four. So, I have it up here, so you have a cheat sheet. So, how many books are there in the Old Testament? Has anybody counted them up? Right, 39, right? There's 39 books, and there are four divisions, or I like to call them four shelves, in the Old Testament library. There's the books of law, and who was the author of, generally considered the author of the books of law? Moses. Then we have the books of history, which were written by various people. Um, then we have, of course, the books of wisdom, which had also different authors. And then we have the prophets. Most of those books are named after the person who was the author. And what is a prophet again? What is a prophet? A spokesperson. In this case, it would be someone who God gave special revelation to a particular person. Their job was to deliver that message to the people. And some of those prophets, like Jeremiah, can you imagine Jeremiah? He's one of the major prophets. He preached his whole life and lived what's called a blameless life. He's called the weeping prophet. And do you know how many people listened to him? Zero. In his whole life, he preached as a true prophet of God. He said, wake up, we're going to be destroyed. If we don't turn around, no one listened to him. And the nation was destroyed and carried off in exile. And he's called the weeping prophet because he literally watched it happen. He watched it happen. Okay, now on to the New Testament. Now, the New Testament has similar type books. It has four shelves, just like the Old Testament. The first shelf that we have is, let me see if it's up here or not, the Gospels. Yes, it is. Probably the most famous four books of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, the Gospel accounts are the four individuals, Matthew, who is one of the apostles, Mark, who is called John Mark, who traveled with Apostle Paul. We're going to learn who all these people are. Luke, who is also one of the assistants to the Apostle Paul, and he was a doctor. He was a physician who wrote. And, of course, the Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote the book of Revelation. Then he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the letters that were there. But each of these four are called Gospels. Gospel simply means God's spell. It's Old English. God's spell combined, which means God's story. So the gospel message simply means the story of God working. So each of these four people recorded their account of the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. And if you've been on Sunday mornings, we're talking about the gospel of John. John says specifically in his book, I have wrote all these things down so that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the Gospels. But it doesn't stop with the Gospels. We have a shelf, kind of a thin shelf here in the New Testament, the book of history. We have one book of history. Whoops, not on my, my chart, on my screen up there. The one book of history is also written by Luke, the physician, and he wrote the story of Acts. He traveled as a, a partner with the Apostle Paul and other people. And so we're even going to see sometimes in, in Acts, it'll change from they to we during that. And you can read it and you can actually tell when Luke was with him and when he was hearing and getting reports from other people. He wrote the book of Acts, which records the life of the first century church. And then after that, we have a third shelf, 21 letters to the churches. Now, they're called epistles. And there are different kinds of epistles. Epistle simply means it's the Greek word for letter. So an epistle simply means it's like a correspondence that someone would write to another person. And so the early churches would have a gospel, and then they would have these letters that they collected from the apostles, including Apostle Paul, that helped them to learn. And all the epistles, by the way, were written. If you think, well, my church has, I don't like to go to church. Churches have problems, and they got all these things going on. Well, what you'll find when you read these epistles is that every one of these epistles was written, guess why? Because there was a problem in the very first churches. This is not a new thing. And that's why, because you have imperfect people. And so because you have imperfect people, the churches are going to have problems. And so these epistles were written to these different churches to instruct them on, often it was specific problems that were going on in the church, and also to just help them to organize as they began to grow. So we have these church epistles. And then we have what are called the pastoral epistles. There were two mentor E's of Paul uh, that, that he wrote letters to, Timothy and Titus. And so these are letters written to these two men, which were also shared among the churches that deal mostly with leadership in the church and how to organize and those sort of things, Timothy and Titus. And then we have the personal epistles, Philemon and Hebrews, which were just written to groups of people that were recorded. And then we have the next section, which is called the general epistles. 
In the general epi epistles, each of those is named after the person who authored them. So Paul's letters are written, named to the people who was receiving them, but these general epistles were written by the person who actually sent them, who was the author of them. So James, for example, was the pastor of the, the first church in Jerusalem, and uh, he was Jesus' half-brother, is the author of the book of James. Also, you come out of Jude. Guess who Jude was? Was Judas. That was one of Jesus' other half-brothers. By the way, who were in John, right? Early, in, They didn't believe he was the Messiah early in the life. And then later on, they both were martyred and wrote important books. And of course, we have the Apostle Peter and Apostle John who wrote those letters also to different churches. And then we have the last book in the Bible, which is called what? Pro Re Revelation, right? That's the one book of prophecy that's also written by the Apostle John. The Apostle John was put in exile. He was arrested. He was put on the Isle of Patmos. Exile means he, wouldn't, he was like being in solitary confinement while he was there. It was the final prophecy, and that prophecy was about the coming new age, when the new, es new Testament age would end and things that would happen. And it's a fascinating book when we get there and look at it because it's the one book in the Bible that said the people who study this Bible will be blessed. And so that applies not only to the book of Revelation, but to all the books. So now I just want to, at the, you see the Roman numeral four on the top of page five. I want you to highlight this, these first verses, if you have a marker or a pencil. It says, it is impossible for any Christian to mature without a systematic method of studying the Word of God. One of the things in the, as a pastor that I'm happy about in one regard, but I'm very sad about another regard. When I have someone come up to me and say, I've been going to church my whole life, and no one ever told me this thing about the Bible or that thing about the Bible. You know what that means? And I know there's different things that are going on. It means that in their lifetime, they haven't purposely sat down and sort of systematically gone through studies. And sometimes, guess what? These will be very educated people. They have master's degrees or higher education. I mean, they spend a lot of time in systematic study, but they've never taken out time in their life to systematically study God's Word like they would American history or ancient French history or any, all these other obscure things that will take lots of time to invest our energies into studying, but we've never applied that to God's special Revelation, And you cannot grow, you cannot understand the purpose and meaning of your life or to help your kids or grandkids or nieces, nephews or friends, the purposes and, and things in their life if you don't understand God's character and His purpose. Because each of our purpose in life is wrapped up in God's purpose. And so that's why I want to encourage you when you feel get discouraged like this is a big study to keep on keeping on because this is God's special revelation and it will literally change the rest of your life. And of course, we're going, going through this pretty quickly. Now, what about studying the Bible? There's a suggestion here that I think is a good one. This is a big book. As a matter of fact, did you know you may not be aware of this, but Bibles are printed. Have you ever noticed on kind of weird paper? Have y'all noticed that? Do you know why they're always on this kind of fancy, weird paper? Because if you printed a Bible on this kind of paper, copier paper, it would be about eight inches thick. So you can't, that's how many pages are in your Bible. So they can't print a Bible on regular paper because this special paper is about a third of the width or less of normal paper, the weight of paper. So they have to print it on this really special kind of paper so that it won't be eight inches thick so that you can actually carry it around. Now, some of them you've probably seen are eight inches thick and you wouldn't carry them around. But that's, the point is, it's a lot of information. And so, you know, people, it's often strange. People say, well, I'd like to know more about God or I'd like to find out God's will in my life. But they talk about it as if it's some big secret. Like God's kind of hiding His will out somewhere and we got to go look around and dig and find and try to figure out what God's will for His life is. God has given us a special revelation so thick that we can't even print it on regular kind of paper. So what excuse do we have not to be familiar with God's Word? What excuse do we have not to understand God's character and His purpose? And that connected to it is our purpose and the kind of character that God wants us to have because remember, God has made this world very good. And of course, it's a fallen world, but we can still apply God's principles and His teaching and His ways to our life, and we can reap the benefits in this life as well. Because here's something in our lost world. You can get very frustrated with things that are going on in our culture, in any lost culture, in any time in history. But think about this. Jesus had no money. 
Well, he had a treasurer, and we're going to see this next Sunday, but his treasurer was a crook. Right, we talked about that, right? Judas was the treasurer. Jesus didn't need any money. He changed the world with no money. He had no political influence whatsoever. He had no political party. He had no political position. He was born into like the most insignificant type of family. They were day travelers that were paid daily wages. He had no money. He had no political affiliations. He had no social status among people. And he only lived until he was 33 years old. And yet he changed the world. Isn't that amazing? He was the most influential great leader of the world, and yet he didn't use any of those, had no army, had no government, had no, had, didn't have any of those things, but he had one thing. Of course, he was God, but he had the truth, and he had God's Holy Spirit. And here's the, where we're going to end with this message. We have those same resources with us today. And so if you want to impact the world where you are, you have the same Word of God, you have the same Holy Spirit that Jesus himself used to change the world. And so I just want to encourage you with that. And we're going to close in prayer, and then we'll have a time of question and answer after we finish. Our Father, we are so thankful that you have not left us with just general re revelation. We have to speculate and guess and come up with our own theories and ideas about meaning and purpose, but that you have laid it bare, that you have revealed it in special ways over thousands of years, and you have had it kept sacred for us. And I pray as we go through this study together that each person here would grow closer to you and understanding your character and purpose and would also grow closer to each other and that we would just be a conduits of your truth and your love. In Jesus' name, amen.